are ready for the word here tonight. Amen. God bless you. One of the great things about being together at Mighty Men of Valor is being together with family. You know, and it's a beautiful thing to have guest speakers, but it's something special. When, when, when one of our brothers is speaking and see, to see uh, what God is doing in their lives, and this next speaker, it's a privilege to introduce him. He's not a stranger. He's a home graduate. Come on, Men's Home. I'm going to know good things come out to Men's Home. He's a home graduate. He's been saved for 25 years. He's been pastoring for 17 years. He's the lead pastor at Victory Outreach Fremont. And he's one of our multi-regional pastors. Would you help me welcome Pastor Anthony Santos? And just one more time, let's ask the Lord to prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. Sermon today 
my message is called Endangered Species. Endangered Species. The Bible says when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, a gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread throughout their ranks. And they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit had prompted them. I want you to now turn over to Revelations chapter 2. Verse 1 through roughly 5, message translation, okay? It'll, there's a method to the madness, so just go to Revelations, if you will. And the Bible says, write this to Ephesus. Or we could even say this morning, write this to the mighty men of valor. To the angel of the church, the one with seven stars in his right fist, Grip, the message translation says, striding through the golden seven lights circle speaks. Here's what I want to talk to us about here today. The Lord says, I see what you've done, men of valor. Your hard, hard work. Your refusal to quit. I know you cannot stomach evil. That you have weeded out the apostolic pretenders or false prophets, some translations will say. I know your persistence and courage in my cause that you have never wore yourself out. But, okay, I have this against you. The message translation says that you have walked away from your first love. The message says why with the question mark. What's going on with you anyway? Do you have any idea how far you've fallen? It goes on to say a Lucifer fall. Turn back. Recover your dear early love. No time to waste. For I'm well on my way to removing your light from the golden circle. Put your hand over your heart. Father, I pray for every man that is here under the sound of my voice. Even my brothers and those that are watching online from, from all over, God. I pray that the same way you gave me this message, that it's the same way I would be able to communicate it into every heart today. Um, I pray that you would use me as a mouthpiece, but also, God, uh, the same urgency that is felt in my heart would be left to everyone here today. Father, we thank you and love you in Jesus' name and everybody together said, Amen. you can go ahead and be seated this morning. Endangered species. When the Lord placed this upon my heart roughly a month or a month and a half ago, I was thinking about leaning more towards the qualities that the early generations, our pioneering generation and our Joshua generation uh, have. And it felt like at that time, that as time goes by, there's certain characteristics that are getting watered down. And so I said, okay, that makes sense to me that it would be the title Endangered Species. But as I begin to, you know, marinate more on this message, it wasn't so much the qualities that once existed that are maybe in danger of being around today, but I felt like it was more of, more of a, more of a, a it was wider than that. It was more broad than that. And as I begin to read Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It's a, a famous scripture that we've all read. We've preached on it. We've done it all with that scripture, especially when it comes down to 50 days after the resurrection, or uh, Easter, if you will, when we begin to talk about the day of Pentecost. And, and, and rightfully so. 
But then as you fast forward over to Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, I begin to find out it just depends on what commentary you read. One commentary, the teacher's knowledge commentary, says that it was roughly 43 years from the book of Acts to Revelations. Then I begin to read others, and none of them are, you know, wrong. They're all estimates, wrong or right. But one, one told me that it was roughly 50 to 60 years from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1, when the Holy Spirit fell on that group of people there in the upper room, and the church was birthed. All the way to Revelation, chapter 2, verse 1, through roughly 5. 50 or 60 years. Commentaries even believe that it was two or three generations had gone by from the time the Apostle Paul first planted that church. And it was even said that he led Priscilla and Aquila. They were a gifted couple back to begin to first pioneer that church in Ephesus. See, the church of Ephesus is much like us. It's facing much of the things that the church of America, more specifically, Victory Outreach is facing. It was also facing economical hardship. It was also facing social injustices of its own. It was also facing political uproar, if you would, because of its geographical location. And people of that day, just like people of today, were looking for hope. But sadly, within that 50 or 60 years, a movement that had started so strong, a movement that had started so promising, was now in a possibility of a spiritual decline of its own. Spiritual decline has been an ever-present thing for the people of God, both then and also today. The decline is more, someone say more, than we see in the news. It goes beyond the nations going to war. It goes far beyond the opioid, opioid problem that we see and beyond the senseless killings of today. It goes far beyond the satanic attacks on all of us. If that's not enough, we see people indulging on almost everything. And they try to escape reality of, of how they really feel. And we are distracted and deeply deceived many times people. Prideful. My God. I think I gave up a sword today. I don't know. But that's all right. That's all right. Prideful and even denying Christ. Sadly, I wish I was talking about the world. But in fact, I just described the church. Unfortunately, I'm describing the church. More precisely, men that are inside of the walls of our churches. You see, this mighty men of valor is more than just a bunch of preachers gathering together trying to wow a crowd. Or preach someone happy this afternoon. This mighty men of valor has to be a conference that shakes you and I to the core. That when you and I go back to our cities, we go back to our families, we go back to our churches, we go back to our ministries, there will be no more similarities between us and the men without Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. The Apostle Paul says, now this, in the last days there will be perilous times. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, and despisers of good. He goes on to say, traitors, headstrong, haughty. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. But yet denying its power. And from such people 
Stay away. The Apostle Paul, sadly, is not describing the city. He's not describing those that are without Christ. The Apostle Paul, sadly, is describing the condition of the church. We are in an hour, my brothers, today, where Lazarus has been in the grave for more than four days, and it stinks. We are in an hour where Jairus' daughter has, 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 has gone sick, and she's dead. Stay with me. We are in an hour when the valley is full of dry bones. We are in an hour where sleeping Eutychus has fallen out of the window and seemingly stumbled to his death. We are in an hour that seems like it's the darkest hour, but that's when God wants to move the most. That's when men need to rise up. The hour is now. I know it looks dark. I know it looks hopeless. I know it seems like it's never going to get better, but I'm here to speak something over your life here today the best I know how. And when it seems like the darkest moment, that's when God has a history of showing up and stepping in. I know it looks bad sometimes in the natural. I know it looks bad sometimes for our churches. I know it looks bad sometimes for our families. I know it looks like things are dead all around us. But my brothers, today, that is the perfect time for revival. Yeah. History proves that in the darkest hours, those are the moments where God steps in and revival begins to happen. So this Ephesian church that we're talking about here this morning, this afternoon, they had like top-notch leadership. I mean, the Apostle Paul himself had planted this church. Paul then handed it over to Timothy. Timothy then either co-pastored it or even might have handed it off to the Apostle John himself. All of them pastored this church in Ephesus. They all had their hands in on this church. And if that wasn't enough, Jesus' mother went to this church. Come on, somebody. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty low-key, like, relieved this morning that Pastor Sonny and the elders and the multi-regionals, they're kind of over there. <laughs> That's a little pressure. Just a little bit. But could you imagine Jesus' mom? <laughs> sitting in your service? While you are preaching? So you can imagine, you can imagine the stellar, top-notch leadership that this church had going on, the church of Ephesus. They were a serving church, Revelation says. They were a sacrificing church, Revelation says. They were a steadfast church, Revelation says. But Jesus says, I have, I have, I have an indictment on this church. The indictment wasn't that they were a busy church. The indictment wasn't that they were a separated church. The indictment wasn't that they were a talented church. The indictment wasn't that they were not a sacrificing church. But the indictment on the church of Ephesus was that they had heart trouble. They had gotten careless in their serving God. And it says they had lost their first love. So the question is this morning, the million dollar question, I guess you can say, for all of us here today, is how do I get my first love back? How do I start this road to getting my first love back? 
Listen, this message may not be for totally everybody, but I have a good feeling there's more than we think. I have a feeling that there's some men here with some dry hearts. I have a feeling that there's some men here with some brittle hearts. I have a feeling that there are some of us here today that we hear this indictment on the church of Ephesus. Well, if we were to really truly be honest, that we would, we would, we would say this, this indictment might very well be on me. So how do we get back to our first love? Number one, what I'm going to give us here today is we need a fresh encounter. We need a fresh encounter. My brother, my pastor friend, my licensed minister friend, my leader friends, my friends, my homies, Uncle Ant, Uncle Ant, like Uncle Ant's in the house today. Now, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm not here to, you know, be condescending to anybody. I'm not here to, to, to make you feel bad or make you even feel worse than. But I am here to say to us here this morning is that we need a fresh encounter. I need a fresh encounter. You need a fresh encounter. Our churches need a fresh encounter. And the reason men are on the brink of becoming instinct is because we simply need a fresh encounter. Keep in mind that the first generation of this church of Ephesus, no doubt, had an encounter in that upper room. The second generation, no doubt, also had an encounter. But as time begins to play out, according to Revelations, some things get lost. Some things get watered down. Some things get forgotten, forgotten in the mix. And according to Revelations, they lost their first love. Sometimes you don't even realize you lost your first love. Until you get away from all the badness. Until you get away from all the noise. Until you get away from all the confusion. Until you get out of, you know, uh, the trenches. And you get into a place like we are today. And then you cannot help but search your own heart in a place like this. We cannot sit under powerful teachings and preachings like we've been over the last few days. And not leave this place. Without doing some kind of heart check within our lives. We spend too much money to come out here. We... Like, I'm like... Like, I know I'm speaking, you know, so... Like, after today, reality will hit me. Because as of right now, I've just been... Like, fire. <laughs> Holy... You know what I'm saying. But I've also been checking my heart. Because I can't get up here and tell you to have a fresh encounter if I myself haven't had a fresh encounter. I cannot sit here. See, things get lost. They have forgotten their first love. See, the danger of not having a fresh encounter is that purity gets lost. Hunger gets lost. Desperation gets lost. And we have, pri we, have pre we have prioritized many things in the church, and rightfully so. We have, pre we have prioritized educating people, and we should. We have prioritized community impact, and we should. We have prioritized leadership development, and we should. We have prioritized financial wellness, and we should. We have prioritized fellowship, being builders, and we should. There's nothing wrong with these things. But the problem is, is when these things become the number one thing, and we push away from the Holy Spirit, then we are no longer having an encounter with God. So my advice to us here today was, yes, keep doing those things, but they cannot be the priority anymore. The priority in the house of God, at least for this message,
message is that we need a fresh encounter. Oh, my brother, you need a fresh encounter. Oh, my brother, you need a fresh encounter. Oh, it's been hard for you. It's been a hard two or three years. Listen, you just need a fresh encounter. Oh, you don't need more money. You need a fresh encounter. You don't need a new house. You need a fresh encounter. You don't need more status. You just need a fresh encounter. You don't need more followers on Instagram. You just need a fresh encounter. You don't need this and you don't need. You just need a fresh encounter. You are but one encounter away from your breakthrough. Someone say, I need a fresh encounter. And what ends up happening is we have a bunch of educated people with no power. We have a bunch of people who can manage their money, but they use it for themselves. We have a bunch of leaders with no power. A bunch of preachers with no power. A bunch of singers. We have an audience, but no power. We have technology, but no power. We have programs, but no power. We have organization and structure, but no power. You ain't hearing me today. We have marketing, money, buildings, projects, teachings, Instruction, classes, smoke machines. <laughs> but you have no power. What this world needs is not a church with just the outside look of a church. But what our world needs today is a church with power. It needs preachers today with preachers with unction from the Holy Spirit. Men and women that have been marinated and bathed in prayer. Men and women, come on somebody, that have no problem getting in the prayer closet. Everybody, everybody wants to get into the room, so do I. But when's the last time you got into the upper room? When's the last time you got into his room? You want to FaceTime your baby, your grandbaby? When's the time, last time you FaceTime him? When's the last time you've been face to face with the Father? We don't need more programs. We need power. We don't need no new preachers. We need power. We don't need no more this and that. We need power. What seems to be missing is churches without encounter. My God. <laughs> Everybody churching, but nobody changing. Everybody praying, but not believing. Everyone singing, but you ain't set free. Everybody hooping and hollering, but you ain't humbling. I don't know what you came here for this morning, but we came for an encounter. I didn't get on a plane, two planes, three planes, to come down to San Antonio, Texas, just eat some barbecue. If that barbecue don't have power, I don't want it. What a burger! What a burger! What, a, what about what about him? What about his power? Oh, I want a water burger. You don't need another water burger. What about his presence? What about what about him? What about him? Some of us need to stay away from Whataburger.
get sharp, aren't we? We're casket sharp. We're casket sharp, but we ain't heavenly ready. We speak in tongues, but we don't even speak to our neighbor. We run up and down the aisles. We run up and down the aisles, but we're not running to the throne. We're dancing, but we ain't even delivered. The men who are not praying are not straight. Are, men who are not praying are straight. We have a lot of organizers, but few agonizers. We have a lot of players. You got your cologne out of someone's trunk. Come on, somebody. We got a lot of players but few prayers. A lot of singers, but few cleaners clinging to him. We got a lot of leaders, but few wrestlers. A lot of fears, but no tears. Much fashion, but no passion. A lot of interferers, people interfering, but few intercessors. Many fighters, but few fires. We got a lot of tweeters, but few leaders. We got a lot of commentaries, but few commanders. It took me a lot to write that down. I like the response I'm getting. <laughs> We have a lot of preachers, but few prayer warriors. Yes, prepare a message, but don't forget to prepare you as a messenger. Because if we're not careful, we can become almost like the book of, almost like the church of Ephesus. They were on the brink of becoming a museum. Because they were on the brink of no encounter. When we take the encounter out of our lives, we become a relic. We become something of just past encounters. We become something of the past. And sadly, there can even become a generation that does not even know it's past. Encounters are simply God's way that he begins to mark territory. And so without no fresh encounter, there's new, no new territory that we're taking. So that's why I say here today for us to get our first love back, we have to have a fresh encounter. So that's our homework. Starting today, is you and I cannot afford to go back without an encounter with him. Secondly, how do we get back to our first love? Is not only we, we have a fresh encounter, but we also, we also need revival, not religion. We need revival, not religion. You see, the exterior of Ephesus, they had all the right ingredients from the outside. They were gatekeepers of truth, according to Revelation. They didn't compromise, according to Scripture. They were a persevering people. They knew how to fight. They knew how to advance. They knew how to stick it out. Outwardly, they were doing everything right. They had the founder's picture up in their foyer. They had all the elders' pictures up in their foyer. Their men's home had the founder's picture. Their women's home had all the elders' pictures. Even had your baby picture right next to it. Come on, somebody. Just trying to make you laugh. Outwardly, they were doing everything right. But inwardly, according to the book of Revelations, they were declining with no fresh encounter. Remember, the Apostle Paul was the most religious, religious person besides the Pharisees in the Bible. But he planted this church. 
And for sure, he made sure that first generation did not have a hint of religion in them. Timothy and John the Beloved, the second generation, they did their best to make sure that they had fresh encounters in the midst. And now it appears that religion has snuck its ugly head inside of that church. You see, religion is sneaky, my friend, because the goal of religion is to make it difficult for revival to break through. And therefore, and thereby, making it comfortable and pampering the flesh. Religion is shallow. Some would say it's shallow. Religion is dry and boring. It doesn't require a lot of sacrifice. It doesn't require a lot of effort. It requires absolutely no desperation. Because it's not, it's not, it's not spiritual at all. It actually settles for the status quo. Religion will always push against true revival. Its goal is to create complacency and spiritual slumbering amongst its members. Religion wants you to think, my brother, that you're all tapped out with God. It wants you to think that you have reached your limit with God. It wants you to take, it, it, it wants you just to kind of settle right where you're at. Take it easy, you're getting too radical now. Religion is going to be waiting for all of us when we go home. We're going to bring back that fire on Sunday. We're going to bring back an encounter on Sunday. And you can bet that there will be some people looking at you all smug. Down at you from your nose. Oh, oh, I heard that. Oh, I heard that. All of a sudden. All of a sudden. Mr. Flesh. Fleshly Snipes. Now he wants to be all holy. Oh, I know some things about you. How dare you lift up your hands? How dare you be gone for a week and come back on fire? How dare you think that one week? That's religion. That, don't you dare let religion steal your encounter. Don't you dare let religion come and talk you out of your calling. Don't you dare let religion come and talk you out of your calling. I got news for religion. I got news for religion. You can come all you want. They came after Jesus. They came after the disciples. What makes you think it's not going to come for us? But I got news for religion. We're here to make you mad. I'm here to make religion mad. I'm here to... Okay, I'm running out of time. It's going by fast. Oh my God. See, but it's going to take a desperate heart who's not afraid to get in the dirt and dig a little deeper. See, religion is appealing to our flesh because it's all about us and not about him. Religion will tell us we can continue without him but act as though we have him. But revival embarrasses religion. Because religion cannot change anyone. You know why it can't change anyone? Because it's counterfeit. It promises you things, but it will never be able to deliver. It promises you status. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, did anybody tell you who I am? And if they haven't, let me remind you who I am. I'm a graduate of the home. We are a class all by ourselves. So if you haven't gone through the home, you need to back up off. I only allow guys that graduated the home to speak into my life. Oh, 
you didn't finish the home? No. You know how we get? Come on, talk to me. You know how we get? We get religious real quick. We get religious real quick. I said we get religious real quick. But we're here to get rid of religion today. Religion has no place in victory outreach. We have not been around 55 years because we tapped into religion. We've been around 55 years because our founder has taught us how to have an encounter. The elders, the pioneers have taught us how to have an encounter. The Joshua generation has taught us how to have an encounter. And now the third wave generation is learning how to have an encounter.
goes on too long, possibly. Possibly. If change is not made, possibly. I'll remove your impact. I'll remove your authority. I'll remove your voice from the inner city. If you don't, we don't, all of us don't repent yeah. and get back to our first love. This is so urgent that the condition of the inner cities is hanging in the balance. I know we thought it was our buildings. It was our parking lots. It was our smoke machines that makes the impact. But could it be that God is getting ready to sign a heavenly indictment on the mighty men of valor this morning that if we do not get back to our first love, I don't even feel qualified to say this. I don't even know what I'm going to do now. But if we do not get to our first, back to our first love, it's just a thought. Let me put it like that. Here's a thought. Will he, could he, raise someone else up that will not be ashamed to repent and not be afraid to get back to their first love? It's how serious I feel it is. Now you can swallow that pill however you want. As we get ready to sing. Go ahead. Wow. Hey Amen. Right there where we're at, if we can go ahead and stand real quick. message for all of us and I know it went out to the men there in San Antonio but I, I I believe that this is the season we're in as a church as well he spoke on getting back to our first love and and I pray that we understand the urgency behind this too is we're, we're right at the cusp of whether we're going to sustain revival or whether we're going to die out whether we're, we're going to become a relic in a museum and that's the reality is if we don't continue pursuing after the presence of God, if we don't continue pursuing after a fresh encounter daily, and if we don't, if we're not willing to repent in order to, to experience that encounter, then everything that's been worked for these past two and three years will all go to in vain. The impact's going to go, our, the, the building will go, everything is going to go, the power is going to go, and the reality is, is there's an urgency and I pray and I believe and I know that our pastor would, is believing that this will be a church, this will be a model for what he was speaking on. A, a church that is in pursuit of God, a church that is hungry after the presence of God, a church that isn't scared to repent. But tonight we're just going to set an atmosphere for a few moments. We, If this message, if this word ministered to you at all, if you say... Maybe I need a heart check tonight. Maybe my heart has grown cold. Maybe it's gone dry. Maybe my, my prayer life's gotten dry. Maybe maybe there's no power anymore. I'm not, I'm not experiencing power anymore. And I'm still operating and, and it's dry and it's, it's, it's weak and it's lacking something. Whatever it is, if there's any part of this message that ministered to you, I encourage you, begin to make your way to these altars. We're gonna be here for a few moments. But we really want to posture ourselves as a church and as a place that our pastor was speaking on that, that is really holding on to, to this message, to this word, that we would be a model for International, for NorCal, for the Bay Area.